talk to you today about what I've entitled God. How many people say that's a pretty broad stroke? Uh, you know, I was thinking as prepared for this message, some people call him the man upstairs, some people call him father, some people call him holy, some people thank him, some people blame him. God Elion is the God that created the heavens and the earth, and he made us in his image. And I read something the other day, and Michelle has it for me back here, that prompted me to this message, and it was by Tozer. I was reading in a book, and it says this, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you, and you've got to think about this, because it affects everything else in your life. So who you say God is affects everything in your life. If God is the creator of heaven and earth, and God is the central power of all things, and God is above all things and in all things, and through us he works by his grace, then who I say God is determines the outcome of my life especially in peace and joy. And so if I'm living in fear or I'm lacking joy or I'm lacking peace, then a lot of times it is my view and my standpoint on who I might say God is. Now, Sam Rodriguez said this, and this was very interesting to me. Your human perception is not God's reality. Your human perception, well, I think God is this, and I think that God would do this, and I think God becomes this. All of us have a human perception, but the human perception doesn't create the ultimate reality of who God truly is. And who we perceive him to be is not necessarily who he is. And so I want to talk to you this morning about three things. I want to talk to you, first of all, about the existence of God. Because if we're going to talk about God and who he is and what he means to us and uh, what his role is in our life, what his role is in the universe... The first thing we've got to do is determine that he exists. And so I would stand with the microphone today and tell you that God exists because I believe that the word of God is the absolute truth of God, which establishes the person of God. Amen. You got to think about that. It, it's not my opinion or someone else's opinion. If God's word is the absolute truth, then the word of God is what establishes the person and existence of God. And then therefore there's no more argument because you can't argue with absolute truth. Perception and reason won't argue with absolute truth. And so we look at this and see this. If you open up your Bible, any Bible or your tablet or your phone or you version or whatever you're using. If you open up your Bible, the very first words in any Bible is this. This is going to be the shortest text you've ever heard for a sermon, besides Jesus wept. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And how many people have ever had a kid or someone or a friend or maybe even a smart element say, well, if God always was, then who created God? Well, I've got something for you here, and I want you to see this and get this. The scripture introduces and assumes the existence of God, and nowhere in scripture does it try to disprove it. So here's what I want you to get and see is this. If there is a God and he does exist, then his word establishes and assumes that he does exist and starts the word of God that we would say is the absolute truth of God. In a court of law, I don't know what happens now because the results I see, I'm not sure what happens and who's honest and who's not honest. But in the court of law, do they not usually, even if the president's sworn in or someone, they hold their hand on the Bible. Why do they hold their hand on the Bible? I swear to tell the truth, the absolute truth. Their statement and testimony that they will tell the absolute truth is founded upon the absolute truth. So if the word of God is the absolute truth, then the word of God establishes that the person of the God exists. And we see this because the word of God opens by telling us in the beginning God. So God was in the beginning and nowhere in the word, which is absolute truth, does it try to prove or try to disprove uh, that there is a God. But how many people know over and over and over it proves there is a God? Now, here's what proves that there is a God to me is salvation and love and joy and peace. 
Kelly talked a moment ago, I don't believe that God just saves us from something, but God also saves us for something. And one of the things that I've seen in culture lately is, is people who are saved from something, that's kind of where their experience stops, and they don't really believe that God has saved them for something, which means to be sought and lighted, to be an example, to take territory, to be his hands and feet extended. And then... I see on this side people that are saved for something. It's all good. They do things. Their hands and feet extend. They've not really been saved or redeemed from something in the sense of living in the righteousness and fullness of God. So you say, what are you saying? Uh, Rob, I'm saying this, that when I was 11 years old and my mom and dad accepted Christ into their life, to me that proved that there was a God. Because God is love and God is the changer of humankind and human hearts and he created us and made us in his own image. Now here's what I say and this is my little scripture verse here, Ephesians 4, 6 there is one God and one Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. One translation is southern because it says in you all. <laughs> now here's a little statement that I've said for years and I want you to get this. Nothing could exist without the existence of God. So it's kind of like the chicken and egg, and people want to know, well, how did God exist if there was nothing else? Nothing could exist before God. So God was the beginning of all things, and in him was the beginning of all things, because nothing could exist without God before God was. And so once God existed, then everything else began and was created in him. He is before all things, and in him all things exist. So there's the existence of God. Now, the second thing that I want to talk about, and this is so important, because if God does exist, then who is this God, and what is this God all about? There's a favorite scripture of mine that says this, God is love. God is love. It's his loving kindness that draws us to repentance. So here is God. He is God, but he's gracious. He is righteous, but he is just. He is holy, but he is love. Now, this to me, this next slide, is the essence of God's heart. How many people would say God is holy? How many people would say God is love? This is the, the essence of God and God's heart. And I want you to get this and see this. His holiness will not allow him to not deal with sin. You don't get anything else, get this. God doesn't just wink at sin. God doesn't just wink at unrighteousness. God doesn't just wink at disobedience. His grace and mercy and righteousness covers us because he's a just God and he sent Jesus and that's the essence of God. Look at this. His holiness won't allow him to not deal with sin, but his love sent Jesus to die so that you wouldn't have to die. Yeah. Whew. So God does exist. He was the beginning of all things, and he is the beginning of all things. But the essence of God is this, that he's 100% holy, but then he's 100% loving. So God is holy and God is loving. So in his holiness, he could not deal with sin. So he dealt with sin. How did he deal with sin? He sent Jesus to die for you and me so that we wouldn't have to die in our sin and our trespasses. I want to be totally transparent. There are times where I feel unlovable. There are times where I feel like, God, where are you? You're a million miles away. And when I feel those feelings coming on, I remind myself of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Because if you don't feel like you're important to God, you don't feel like God exists, you don't feel like God loves you, think about what Jesus paid on the cross by being beaten and forsaken and shedding his blood and Christ, God turning his back on him and him becoming the sin for all mankind, him drinking of the cup and him tasting of death that was life, that proves the redemptive power of God. God is 100% holy. He cannot not deal with sin, but he's 100% love. So he sent Jesus to die and take on sin, our sin, so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Blessed be the name of the Lord God. That is the essence of of God. But God, how many people know when we were still far away from God? 
in our sins and trespasses, but God still loved us with such great love. Did someone just say amen? amen. God loved us with such great love. He is so rich in compassion and in mercy. This is the essence of who God is. Even when we were dead and doomed in our many sins, he united us into the very life of Christ and saved us by his wonderful grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn us, but that through him we might be saved. I went to a camp meeting about eight years ago, and I heard a worship leader who was very instrumental in my life, Lyndall Cooley, who led worship for the Brownsville Revival, and his pastor is still John Kilpatrick, and Lyndall started a church in Nashville, but he was preaching at some friends of mine at Cincinnati's church, and Lyndall preached a message, and he said something in that that I've never heard in this way that really stuck with me. He said this, he said, God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. Y'all looking at me, yeah, well, that's what it says, I know. But he said it in a way that I'd never thought about, and it struck a chord with me because I grew up and were believing that it was like God was kind of this displeased, angry God who was kind of sitting on his throne with a ruler, and, and any little thing that Robbie did was like, psh, 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 psh. You know, I break my pencil, shucks, better go to the altar and pray. God's going to get you. And I think sometimes we have this picture of God's on his throne and he's holy and he can't be pleased and, and, and he, he's out to get us. And we get this picture of God. And I, I had that picture of God as a kid, but I don't have that picture of God anymore because it was God's love for you and God's love for me that sent Jesus to the cross to die for me so that I wouldn't have to die, so that I wouldn't have to die in my sins and my trespasses. And that redemptive grace runs from Genesis to Revelation through the whole book. It's not an Old Testament, New Testament thing. God's grace is from Genesis to Revelation. And as the songwriter says, how many people know this grace has saved me and that same grace will lead me home. Hallelujah. The eternal attributes of God are really something that is important. And these are not big words, but omniscient, omnipotent. And I'm not present. And these are things that really define who God is. So we have the existence of God. We have the essence of God and his holiness and his love. And now we have the eternal attributes of God. So if these are the attributes of God and they're eternal, then it means that they don't change according to circumstance, situations, or feelings. Because they're established upon the truth of God. Let's look at the first one here. If God is omniscient, that it means this, that he knows everything and he sees everything. You may not know this today, but that is good news. How many people ever met someone you said, well, you just think you know everything? Huh? Anybody ever said that to you? I've got news for you. There's only one who knows everything and sees everything. And why should that be so important today? Why should you be smiling today in a, in a sermon, in a message that is kind of stretching you because it's a little deeper and it's a little wider and it's a little broader and it has to make you think. But why should that encourage you? Because I'm going to take eternal deep truths and bring it down right to where you are. God is your vindicator. God is your peace. God is your strength. And there are things that you say that people misunderstand. There are things that you do that you feel like no one sees or notices. If this is true, that God is omniscient, then it means that he sees everything that you do and nothing goes in vain. It means that he knows the very hairs of your head and that he knows your heart and he knows your motive and he knows why you said it. He is your God and he loves you. He's for you. He's not against you. He knows everything and he sees everything. Here's what the scripture says, and this is one, and of course David was a man after God's own heart, and he said this, Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. Is that astounding? How many people, that's kind of scary too. You ever, you know, a couple weeks ago I talked about if we put a little bubble above your head, what would it be saying right now? 
if we put up a video of your past week and how you handled things and did things on the announcements today, how many people know? We, but yet God sees everything and knows everything, and he's 100% holy, but yet he's 100% love, and we've established that he already exists, and he exists to have a relationship with me and you, and then these are the eternal attributes of God that he sees everything and knows. Is it astounding that God knows everything about you, yet he still loves you? That's astounding. So David's saying this, you perceive every movement of my heart and soul, and you understand my every thought before it enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book, and you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. Michelle, just keep that right there. If you've not smiled about anything this morning, you need to smile right now. Because the Word of God establishes the truth of God, which has nothing to do with what I think, feel, or imagine, or conjure up in my mind, or what someone else has said about me, or thought about me, or I've even thought about myself. That God knows me like an open book before I open up my mouth. He knows what's coming out of my mouth. And before I take a step, He knows my journey. I preach this message again, but it really fits here greatly. The Bible says this. He says he establishes my end from the beginning. So he sees everything and he knows everything. And can I just say it this way? That when we mess up or when something happens, God is not in heaven on his throne scratching his head saying, didn't see that coming. Wow. Out of all the things that could have happened yesterday, I'm God now. Out of all the things that happened yesterday, out of all the things that Rob could have done, didn't really think he would do that. Didn't really see that happening. Can I tell you today that there is nothing that makes God nervous, nothing that makes God uncomfortable, nothing that takes God by surprise, nothing that takes God off guard. God is in heaven and he rules and he reigns and he is in complete authority of the situation. So if you're on a journey today, he sees your steps before you even take your steps and that should encourage you. Now let's look at another thing here. He's omnipotent. Which means he's all power, having unlimited power. you got to get this and see this today. Here, here's the thing, though. You know the power that God has in your life is the power you have to believe. You know God has one displeasure. You know what it is? It's to be displeased. You know what being displeased is? It's being not believed. God's displeasure is this, you not believing him. It says... Without faith, <laughs> that's what the Word of God says. It's impossible. Think about it. So God's greatest displeasure is when I don't believe Him. So if you don't get anything else today, get this, that God is omnipotent, and His Word establishes that He is omnipotent various, various, numerous, numerous times, so therefore He is capable of doing anything. But when the scripture says this, and Jesus himself says it, with men things are impossible, but with God nothing is impossible. I've got the scripture right behind this. Go ahead and flip it up there, Michelle, so they can see it. I'm not lying. For nothing is impossible with God. But, but here's, what, here's what Jesus said in Matthew. He said this, with men there are some things that are impossible, but with God there is nothing impossible to them that believe. To them that believe. So what I've got to do is say, God, there's nothing you can't do. Your arm's not short. Your hands are not heavy. Your heart's not hardened. You're not blind. You hear. You see everything perfectly. You know everything perfectly. Therefore, I believe and confess that you are capable and able of doing anything because you are God and you are omnipotent. Hallelujah. Let's look at another one. Omnipresent. I love this. Here's the definition, constantly encountered 
everywhere at the same time. Michelle, just keep that up there for a minute. How many moms or grandmoms do we have in here today? How many have ever said this with kids or grandkids? I can't be everywhere at the same time. How many people have ever said, I wish I could duplicate myself? How many people have ever said, I wish I could be all these different places at one time? You've got to get this and see this. God is omniscient, which means he knows and sees everything. God is all-powerful, which means he can do anything and everything. And then God is omnipresent, which means he can be everywhere at the same time. So what that means is we can pray for the people in Pittsburgh that experienced tragedy yesterday. And because God lives in us... God goes before us and God is with them. When we pray, we come into agreement that thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And God sees what we don't see about it. He knows what we don't know about it. He's able to do what we can't do about it. And he's already there. Amen. So you say, well, then why do you pray then if he's already there? Because prayer dispatches heaven and prayer brings agreement. And with agreement comes power. So when I begin to open up my mouth, God begins to enlighten someone that's already there. Hey, I need to go do this today. Or I need to call this person today. Or I need to help this person today. Or God adds strength to what they've already done or what they're already doing because God is already there. I have uh, family members right now that are suffering a loss and very close to our family. And, and I prayed for them this morning before I came out here. So what I know is when I pray. When Jesus said, pray, he said, our Father which art in heaven, God, we've established the existence of God. We've talked about the essence of God, and now we're talking about the eternal attributes of who he is. So when I say, Father, be with my family today in Jesus' name, when I open up my mouth, I'm believing that he sees and knows everything about that situation. <laughs> that he's powerful enough to do something about the situation. And that he's already there because he's with me in my office and he's with my family in Chillicothe all at the same time. So when we see this constant, I want to just kind of say this too. God's desire is for you to have a relationship with him. That's why he sent Jesus. Adam kind of messed everything up. But your sin and your shortcomings doesn't change God, it changes you. Because God still showed up to Adam to have relationship with him and to walk with him. And there's an old song that we used to sing and it was this, in the garden. He walks with me and talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own and the joy we share as we tarry. Tarry's a word of the past, isn't it? If a video is over a minute, I'm off of it. If a text is over 120 characters, you're done. Terry is a word that we seldom use or seldom talk about because we move on to the next thing. And everything's noisy and everything's next and everything is moving and everything is shaking. And when we're quiet, we're uncomfortable. But yet God says, be still and know that I am God. And we say, God, where are you? I think sometimes he said, if you just get off of Facebook for a minute, I'm right here. I'm preaching to myself. If you just quit talking and listen, I'm right here. I'm in a whisper. But your mind is so busy and noisy. Your heart's so troubled. Your life's so cluttered. And I desire that close communion. I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to tarry with you. I want joy to be restored in you. I want you to know that I'm yours and you're mine. Listen, I accepted Christ at 11 years old. I turned 50 in March. I've been doing ministry for over 35 years. And the prayer that I've prayed for the last six months is, Father, I want to know you. Listen to me. I'm not done. And I want you to know me. I want you to know me. Listen, I don't want to hold a microphone and 
preach a message and a sermon and not walk in relationship with God, my creator. We were privileged to be part of a pastor's gathering in Arkansas with Bishop Tony Miller. And Bishop was talking about the scripture and the passage that I've used a gazillion times in funerals. John 14. I'm going away to prepare a place that you might be with me also. And I've preached it, taught it from this angle. That's God's desire that you be with him also. But Bishop said something I never thought about. He said this. God doesn't want to just be with you in heaven. He wants to be with you now. He wants relationship with you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to talk with you. He wants joy to be there. He wants to tear. He wants, he wants you to know that you're his own. The joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever known. You know why none other has ever known? Because no one can have the experience that you can that you experience. That's right. That's right. My hands were freezing all morning and I was touching everyone, shaking hands, and having fun with my cold hands. And <laughs> Kelly's usually freezing. I reached over and held her hand and said, Oh, you're cold. My hands were cold. Couldn't get them warm. You say, What are you saying, Rob? I'm saying this. Is we can get in a circle and pray, and you can hold Kelly's hand. But you won't have the same experience that I have holding Kelly's hand. Because she's in my heart. And we're in covenant. And I'm in love. And the relationship with God, our Father, what you experience, I can't experience. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other ever know. It's not that you won't know the joy and the pleasure, but you won't know the joy and the pleasure I share in the way I share, and I won't know the joy and the pleasure you share in the way you share it because it's individual, but God wants to meet us there, and whatever we're going through, he's walking with us, and he sees it, and he knows it, and he's capable of handling it, and he's already there. He's surrounding us. Do you know that God's above us? God's below us. God's beside us. God's behind us. God is everywhere, and he lives on the inside of us. Whew. He's a great big God. Now, this is the Lord talking to the prophet Jeremiah. And there's another for me. This is chapter 23 and 29, 11. The scripture we quote is, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans for a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. So this is the Lord, listen, talking to Jeremiah. Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord. He just asks that question, and he doesn't even answer, but he does establish a thought. He says this, do I not fill the heavens and the earth? <laughs> who declares the Lord. I, am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off. Amen. So here's what I want to get you to see is this, is God is saying there's nothing and nowhere you can hide, and that's okay, it's a good thing. Because like Adam and Eve who covered themselves, God wants you to uncover yourself so that he can cover you in his mercy and his grace and his power and his love and his joy and his peace and his strength. But what God's saying to Jeremiah, he's saying to us, there's no place you can hide that I can't see. There's nothing in your life that you can hide that I cannot see because I'm already there. I feel the heavens and I feel the earth and I feel everything in between because I am the Lord God. But here's what I want you to get to see is this. I am a God that is near, not a God who is far off. Amen. That's the kind of God that I serve. And Jesus revealed the heart of and the humanity of God. Jesus revealed the heart and humanity of God. 
when he had taught and fed multitudes and he sat down to rest a while, kids just rushed him like he was a piece of playground equipment. And his disciples were like, get back, get back, get back, get off Jesus, get off his rope. And Jesus said, just let the little kids come up here and climb on my lap. Now, most people believe that Jesus existed. A lot of people believe that he looked differently than some of the pictures we have in our churches at home. I'm not here to debate that. But most people believe that Jesus had a beard. And the Bible, I believe, even declares that. that. So do you think a little kid sat on Jesus' lap without pulling his beard? You think a little kid sat on... I'm going to bring this thing right down to where we are. Because God's wanting you to see this, that he's not a God that is far off, but he's a God who came near and we beheld his grace full of truth and he became flesh and he dwelt among us. And if you want to know what God is like, look at what Jesus is like. And Jesus had compassion. Jesus forgave sin. Jesus hung out with the prostitutes and the down and out. Jesus ate supper with uh, people that offended the religious crowd. Jesus healed the multitude. He touched the untouchable. He saved the unsaveable. He made the lame walk again and the blind to see. And he allowed the little children to come unto him. And with his disciples that didn't believe him, the first thing he said, to them is touch me touch me Thomas if you don't believe after everything that I've done if you don't believe then touch me because I'm not a God that's far off I'm a God that wants to wrap my arms around you and love you and hold you and lift you and have a relationship with you and walk with you I am not a God that's far off I'm a God who draws near I want to hug you and hold you and love you It's amazing when Jesus walked with the two on the man's road and they said that their hearts were not uh, revealed who he was and it was through God. But when he went with them, they said, did not our heart beat within us? And he began to break bread with them and eat with them. And then when he ascended and descended back and appeared to them, the Bible says that he just walked in a room without opening a door. You know what he said? Got anything to eat? Give me some bread. Give me some honey. Give me some fish. I believe that Jesus ate fish and sucked the fish out of his teeth just like I do. I believe Todd that he put honey on his bread and took a big bite of it and the honey dripped down in his beard just like it does me on his face. You say, oh now, Pastor, you're, you're, you're going too far. When we think of a king or a president or a judge, we think of someone who sits on a throne who's untouchable. When we see how the, the rural court works, they wave from a balcony, they wave from a bubble car, and peasants and people gather and watch and wave back. But God said, I'm not that kind of God. Because the people wanted Jesus to set up a throne and rule and overtake the Roman Empire. But he said, I'm not that kind of God. I didn't come to sit on a throne and be pampered. I came to give my life so that you might have life. I came so you might have a relationship with God the Father and live with me eternally. I'm not going to sit on a throne and be pampered. I'm going to get down and wash the dirt off of your feet. I'm going to spread my arms out on a cross and be beaten and forsaken and die for you. I'm that kind of God. Why are you yelling, Rob? I don't know. I just get excited. That's what I do. Yeah. But I think you have disappointment and pain and fear and frustration in your life because you have the wrong picture of God. And what started this whole message for me was Tozer saying this. Your view and picture and perception of God will determine how you handle your life and how you view everything that happens in your life. So this morning I went way back. And hopefully I did it in a way that only I can do it because this is really a deeper message than me. I'm not a hermeneutical, philosophical, doctrinal teacher. But we establish, I'm going to get to the other slide, Michelle, thank you. Michelle did a wonderful job this morning. Give her a little. Thank you. 
We establish that God existed before all things because nothing can exist without Him. We establish that the Word of God is the truth of God, and therefore the truth of God proves the person of God when it says, in the beginning, God. So it meant when the beginning happened, God already existed. Do you get that? Because it says, it's in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's where we get into, in the beginning's time, and the heavens and the earth is space and matter, which we live in now, didn't exist before God because nothing could exist without Him. Then we talked about the essence of God. How He's 100% holy. He's 100% love. He couldn't not deal with sin, but he chose to deal with it through love and not anger and wrath. He chose to deal with it through mercy and grace and through the redemption of his son Jesus so that you wouldn't have to be punished and die, but could have eternal life by faith through grace in him. And then we talked about the eternal attributes of God, which is omniscient God. He sees and knows everything. So he's our vindicator and justifier. He, what the Savior say? He says, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the... I can look you in the eye and look at your heart and still not know exactly what you're thinking and everything you're thinking, but God already knows and sees. And then we dealt with the om, omnipotent, which means God is capable of anything. With God, nothing is impossible. Last thing. Aren't you thankful for a God who is omnipresent? He's everywhere at the same time. He can do anything. And He chooses to forget. And He chooses to love. He wants relationship with you. He's not a God who's just sitting on his throne that's untouchable. He's a God who's near. He's a God who cares. What does this mean? It means this. And I really pray you take courage in this and don't just read these words. It means God knows what you don't know. It means God sees what you can't see. It means God can do what you can't do. And it means God can be where you can't be. Oh, you believe? Yes, I believe. I just wish I could be with my daughter. I understand that. But because you believe and God lives on the inside of you, you can be with your daughter because God is already there. You see what I'm saying? You serve that kind of God. Now, in 1 Corinthians, it's the chapter of love, and it tells us that God is love. And it says that love is patient, love is kind, love is jealous. And I kind of took my liberty, and I rewrote this from the Passion Translation, and I want to read it to you. Because we looked at this broad stroke called God to death. And here's my final conclusion. God is large and incredibly patient. God is gentle and consistently kind. God is not arrogant. God does, does not deal with humanity with shame and disrespect. God is not easily irritated or quick to be offended. God joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. God is a safe place for shelter, for he never stops believing the best for you. God never fails and is never defeated, for he never gives up. God is faithful. God is never stops love. I wanted to talk to you today about God. But 
I want to tell you, he's my God. And he came in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus came to life and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he poured out his precious Holy Spirit to enable and to empower, to gift, to establish. By grace through faith, he's that kind of God. When I think about all the biblical statements that establish God, there's so many. But two that always come to mind is in the book of Daniel, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through the fire. And where Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. And when Daniel slept a better night in the lion's den than he would have at the Holiday Inn Express with the football team on the third floor. He came out of that lion's den. Nebuchadnezzar said this. We will now serve the God of Daniel. Why? Tozer knew why. Because who you say God is affects every area of your life. Daniel knew who God was. That's why when they made a decree and said, you can't pray, Daniel still knelt because he said, I'd rather trust God than trust you. And when he knew who God was, it established his path. And even when it got a little hairy, no pun intended, in the lion's den, he still came out alive. And then the decree went out, we will now serve the God of Daniel. Why? Because Daniel had established who his God is. See, I can stand here today and there are questions you can ask me after this service that I cannot answer. There are scriptures that you can ask me a question about that I might not be able to answer. But I can stand here with a microphone and tell you today about my God. He exists and nothing exists without him. He is love and he is holy. He is all powerful. He is all knowing and he is ever present. That's my God. And I've been serving him and walking with him and learning to know him and learning to hear his voice and his heart for many years now. But then there's one other story in the book of Daniel. It's the book of Shadrach, the, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who's thrown in the fire. And they said this, we would rather be thrown in a fiery furnace and you heat it up way hotter than it should be heated up than to bow to your God, little g, because I know who my God is. And my God is well able to deliver me, but if not. See, Rob, what are you saying? I'm saying this. Before they ever fired up the furnace, before they ever threw more coal or wood in and made it hotter than it should have been, before they ever opened up the furnace door, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had determined in their heart who their God was. Therefore, it affected every area of their life, and they didn't cower to another God, and they didn't walk in fear. They said, if God is not going to get us through this furnace, then he's able to deliver us out of this furnace. And when they turned around and looked, and the people looked in the fire, they said this, there's a fourth man walking in the fire, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just started high-stepping and said, yeah, yeah, there is, and that's my God, who is eternal and is old has existed, who is loving and holy, who is everywhere, all powerful and knows everything, that is my God. That's who I am. And the reason I'm able to do what I do and say what I say and feel what I feel and think what I think and believe what I believe is because I've established in my heart who my God is. Because as Tozer said, Who you say God is determines how you think, live, and behave, and respond. 
what happens around you. How could you, I'm just using two examples, but how could you say throw me in a lion's den? How could you say throw me in a fire? You would have to know who your God is. Do you know how they refer to the fourth man walking in the fire? As Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God. What kind of God do you serve? Who do you say God is? Is he Santa Claus? Just write out a list and he just checks off the list. If you've not been naughty, he gives you what you want. Is he the man upstairs? Is he convenient? Is he someone that you praise and worship or is he someone that you blame? Who you say God is determines how you live your life because God is the central foundation and the beginning of all things. He is in everything. He establishes everything. I want to tell you today, God is a God who loves. God is a God who redeems. God is a God who restores. Sometimes we want God to deliver us out of something and God wants us to walk through something to grow our faith. It's interesting to me. God could have just snatched Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of that situation. They still had to walk through the fire. Not a hair, sins. They didn't even smell like smoke. <laughs> because God walked. How was Daniel able to sleep in the lion's den? I just read it in the Word. God said, I'm in all things and I fill all things, the heaven and the earth and even the lions. Then my presence filled that place. Many people believe different things about the lions. They were fed this, that, the other. God shut their mouths and all this. You know what I believe? I believe that peace put them to sleep. You can't rest if you don't have peace. You can't sleep if you're in turmoil. But Daniel slept all night and the lions didn't even bother him. And I believe it was because he was at such peace, he rested in God. And the peace that he rested in filled that cage to where the lions were in such peace that they just slept right along with Daniel. And I can just see Daniel flopping back and one I'm using that as a pillow. See, who you believe God is determines the peace you have and the joy that you have and what you experience and encounter in your life and even the rest that you'll get tonight when you pillow your head. Don't know where you are. Don't know what you're going through. But I know this. I know my God. He's Elio. He's a creator. He's a maker. He's a ruler, he's a redeemer, he's a restorer, he's a lover, he's a lifter, he's kind, he's compassionate, he's long-suffering. He's that kind of God. He's holy, he's just, he's righteous, he's merciful. Religions painted the wrong picture of God. People have painted the wrong picture of God. The enemy has painted the wrong picture of God. Who you say God is establishes everything for how you live your life, how you move and breathe and have your being. Everybody just bow your heads for a moment. Stand with me. Holy Spirit, just lead this moment. Just lead this moment right now. By your grace, through your mercy. By your grace, through your mercy. people in the sound of my voice, you're walking through something right now that you need a greater trust and faith that God is who he says he is. Just raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone in this room today, you'd say, I've had the wrong picture of God. Just raise your hand. You need to get a different picture. God bless you. Today, that you just need to receive God's peace over a situation. Who that 
is, know what that is. Just raise your hand right now. God bless you. We're going to bless you. We're going to bless you. God is a healer. God is a healer. I feel that right now in my spirit and my heart. Right now, get peace right now. Get 